In the year 2003, South Korea was gripped by a newly emerging serial killer. It would take almost one year to track him down, but by then, he had murdered more than 20 victims and even escaped from prison. So, who is Yoo Young Chul? What were the motives behind his many murders? And what happened in his life to create such a sick and twisted monster? In this video, we will explore his morbid history and how he would become one of South Korea's most feared men. Welcome back to Coffeehouse Crime, folks. My name is Adrian, and today we're looking at a case that gripped South Korea like no other. In this video, we're looking at the morbid world of Yoo Young Chul, and how his terrible actions led him to achieve one of the highest body counts this channel has ever seen. By the way, if you like videos like this, then please consider subscribing as it does really help me out. Otherwise, grab yourself a cup of coffee and let's caffeinate while we investigate. This is the case of Yoo Young Chul. Welcome back to South Korea, folks, also known as the land of the morning calm. Although we have explored this country before, it is important to highlight that, much like Japan, South Korea is an extremely safe place to be. Now, although it's not relatively as safe as Switzerland, Norway, or Japan, it does rank much higher in safety standards than many Western countries, including France or the USA. It is crucial to specify that when discussing Korea, we are of course referring to South Korea for rather obvious reasons. Its northern brother is the most isolated, secretive, and militarized country in the world, so it's rather unlikely that we're going to hear a true crime story from them anytime soon. Moving back to its brighter and more friendly neighbor, South Korea boasts a prosperous economy with stunning landscapes, mountains, plains, and rice paddies to boot. And let's not forget about Korean cuisine, a delightful blend of spicy and sweet flavors that cater to all palates across the globe. Heads up, but I've got a very soft spot for Korean barbecue. It's quite a nice social dining experience where you cook raw meat and vegetables together and enjoy various dishes and condiments at your own pace. Food aside, because honestly I could talk about that all day, let's delve into the vibrant capital city of South Korea named Seoul. By the way, did you know that Seoul has a thriving specialty coffee scene? As of the year 2023, the South Korean coffee market has reached record levels. It is estimated that there are now over 75,000 coffee shops across the country which, by the way, is the equivalent of one cafe per 700 people. Now, although this country is known for its lively atmosphere, friendly locals, and eclectic coffee culture, the case we're looking at today is, sadly, far from upbeat. Our story today begins two decades ago in the year 2003, and it's probably worth saying that, although this is the first officially recorded event, it is not necessarily the beginning. On the morning of September the 24th, 2003, an eerie silence ran through the fog-topped rice paddies and into the bustling city. For most, today was like any other day, but for the faculty staff of Seoul University, something seemed amiss. 74-year-old professor Lee Diok Su failed to show up to work that morning. While his absence perplexed his colleagues and students, nothing seemed to be done about it in the first couple days. But as the days drew by, that feeling of wonder turned into concern. His workplace couldn't get hold of him, and with the days piling up, many grew worried for his own safety. As many of these stories begin, the authorities were called for a wellness check, and unfortunately, after arriving at his residence, they were met with a sad and gruesome scene. Officers wouldn't find one, but two bodies. Lee Diok Su and his wife Lee Yon Uk were both found inside the property, among a very messy and violent crime scene. Forensics determined that, although he had been stabbed in the neck, this wasn't actually the cause of his death. He had suffered blunt force trauma across his head and multiple parts of his body. Now, statistically speaking, homicide is quite rare for elderly people in their 70s, and to add to this, both of these people were quite well liked in the neighborhood and had no enemies. And the motive was just as perplexing. With Diok Su being a professor, it was quite obvious to say that the Lee family were relatively wealthy. But with all valuables remaining in the property, this clearly wasn't about the money. I mean, whoever the killer was, they even left a case filled to the brim with jewelry in the bedroom. So this clearly wasn't with intention for profit. In cases like this with no obvious motive, the killer almost always knows the victims, 
However, upon further investigation, officers realized that all family and friends had an alibi. And so, with no obvious suspects, officers began to dig deeper into the investigation. Just as detectives began to tuck into this case, another startling revelation came only two weeks later. On October the 9th, another incident was reported to the authorities. The home of another family in Seoul had been invaded, and upon entering the property, officers found three bodies. Kang yun Sun, an 85-year-old wealthy woman, alongside her 60-year-old daughter-in-law and her 35-year-old handicapped son, had all been murdered. It was noted that this home was occupied by three vulnerable individuals, making them easy targets for their assailants. Once again, it was a violent and bloody scene and the smell of blood was thick in the air. Officers found the grandmother's body in the downstairs bathroom, and after ascending the blood-covered staircase, they found the other two. Forensic investigators observed that all had suffered a very violent death, which unfortunately was a horrific way for the husband of the grandmother to find his family. After investigating the crime scene and all possible suspects, detectives once again found no leads. The husband, who came came home from work to find his wife, daughter, and grandson murdered, was, quite understandably, beyond devastated. He told the officers that he couldn't think of anyone who would want to do this to his family, and apparently, in desperate grief, he even screamed at the family's fish tank to tell the fish, Did you see who did it? Tell me you know who did. Sadly, this second murder scene was only the beginning of a series of patterned attacks, and only one week later, yet another similar scene would unfold in the Seoul area. That was when 60-year-old Yu Jun hee was found by her son in the afternoon. It was immediately clear that she was near death after being savagely beaten with what authorities could only describe as a large hammer. And although she was alive when her son arrived, she sadly passed away only 30 minutes later. One month later, another elderly wealthy man was found dead in his home. 87-year-old Kim Jong-suk was found deceased along Inside his housekeeper, that being 53-year-old Bei Ji He. Both of them had been bludgeoned to death with a hammer, and according to the blood found at the crime scene, they were killed as they slept in their beds. What was strange about this time is that the house had also been set on fire in an act of arson, supposedly and most likely to destroy any evidence left behind. And unfortunately, the killer was successful too. The authorities found no substantial clues or leads, and the only evidence left behind were a few bloody footprints. It became clear that whoever was behind this long streak of brutal murders was specifically targeting wealthy elderly people in the city. To have five individual homicide incidents happen in such a short time frame was certainly concerning for the authorities, and it definitely kept the public on their toes. What is worse is that nobody knew if the killer would strike again. They didn't know if this was an isolated series of events, or if he would keep on going until he was caught. But at the turn of the new year, Seoul's brand new serial killer would, all of a sudden, stop. And that was for very good reason, because it was around this time frame that officers found one small but crucial piece of evidence. And that was surveillance footage. With this happening in the year 2003, surveillance cameras were still relatively rare in Seoul. However, the owner to a nearby business installed a camera and found something very interesting on the night of a murder. The surveillance camera captured this image of a man coming from the direction of the crime scene. And while that in itself was not alarming to the detectives, it became far more significant to the investigation when one of the murdered family members claimed that his jacket belonged to the victim. The decision to release this image to the public was not considered lightly, but in the end, officers decided that they would have more success in finding their killer if people knew about it. They also offered a huge 1 million won reward for any information that led to the arrest of this killer, the equivalent of 37,000 US dollars or 30,000 pounds. Now, although the news was sure to stop the killer for a short while, he would eventually return at the turn of the new year. But this time, his targets were the complete opposite of his previous victims leading many to believe that maybe Seoul was experiencing two separate serial killers. 
Starting in February of 2004, Soul found itself trapped in a series of chilling disappearances. But instead of elderly people being murdered in their own homes, it was now young women vanishing across the city. It was one month later, in March of 2004, that one of those women's bodies was discovered. The remains of 23-year-old Quan Jin He were found along a trail near Sogang University. What was somewhat puzzling to officers is that her remains were not actually complete. Her body had been dismembered into several smaller pieces, with what seemingly seemed to be multiple chunks of flesh absent from her body. Jin He was a young woman working in Seoul's red light district, and sadly, as is often the case for sex workers, she didn't have the best support network around her. Engaging in night work often comes with a substantial risk to one's safety, and, unfortunately, it often comes as no surprise when sex workers disappear. Many of these women are often faced with financial hardship, are coerced into the profession out of necessity, or alternatively are abducted under false pretenses such as innocent-sounding job offers. And although prostitution was technically illegal in Seoul at the time, corrupt police officers would often turn a blind eye. In fact, some of those officers would even take bribes and form working relationships with many of the working women's pimps. Unfortunately, our mysterious serial killer realized this was a prime community to target. Slowly, over time, many within the red light district began to notice that more and more women were disappearing. And by July of that year, several sex workers were confirmed to have vanished. To be more precise, between April and July of 2004, nine women disappeared from the Mapogu area of Seoul. It was also noted that all of them had seemingly disappeared overnight, usually after accepting a job. Now, most of these jobs involved the escorts going to a pre-arranged location such as a home or a hotel, which, in general, is much safer than going to the red light district. And perhaps no surprise whatsoever, but this would eventually be the beginning to our serial killer's downfall. It was in July of 2004 that one of those local brothels received an at-home request for an escort. Now, this brothel already experienced one of their escorts to disappear a few weeks prior, one who still hadn't returned. And so, with that in mind, they were extra careful with the women that they had left. And that is when they realized that this request came from the same phone number used for the escort that had already vanished. Now, with pimps and covert police officers having regular contact with each other, this was the perfect opportunity for them to collaborate and bring whoever this person was down. And so, at 2am on July the 15th, 2004, that call was made to the authorities and this would mark the beginning to an interesting operation. Detectives had no idea what to expect, and so they organized a typical sting operation, working with the informant and one of his local call girls. And so, after setting the scene, with a rigged park and a squad nearby, they waited with bated breath for their suspect to finally arrive. And in the early morning hours, that is when he appeared out of the darkness. It became immediately apparent that, whoever this suspect was, he did have something to hide. That's because, when confronted by officers, the man suddenly went berserk. In fact, he resisted his arrest so violently that it took five officers to subdue him. What is strange is that, immediately after being pinned to the ground, officers found him to be choking on something in his mouth. They soon realized that he had chewed up the call girl's flyer, and was now trying to swallow it in a desperate effort to destroy the evidence. No surprise, he was apprehended and then arrested, and soon after being transferred to the station, the frantic man was identified to be 32-year-old Yu Young Chul, who, the chief officer noted at the time, was an average to good-looking man, and a far cry from the stereotypical serial killer. Now, we have heard of this before in other countries, but Korean law states that you may only hold a suspect for up to 48 hours without evidence, or then be forced to let them go. So, the game was on for detectives to find some sort of evidence to link him. Conveniently, he had already proven to have a rather violent temper upon arrest. And so, with this information at hand, the interrogators planned to use this to their advantage. Surprisingly, he proved to be arrogant and even proud in their seat, telling the officers that he was the one in charge and they had no control whatsoever. Perhaps a sign of difference in culture and modern day times, but one of the officers then slapped him on the back of 
of his head, which only seemed to anger young Chul even further. Excerpts from the interview show that the officers then taunted him, saying, There is no way you could have killed anyone. I can tell you don't have the stomach for it. Young Chul seethed in his seat, before then asking for a piece of paper. He then began to draw lines on the paper like the markings found on a prison wall. After some time, he then stopped at 30 lines. That is when he said, That is how many people I have killed. I killed those four old bags too. How times have changed. Nowadays, it can take months to crack a serial killer. Back then, all you had to do was slap them around the back of the head, and they'd tell you everything. Being serious though, his confession did take many officers by surprise. I mean, a few of them wondered if he was perhaps behind these escorts disappearing, but no one expected him to be murdering the elderly too. And so, Yu Young Chul was asked to prove it. In response, he was taken around half a mile away from one of the crime scenes and asked which home he invaded. But after failing to go to the right property, several of those officers began to have doubts. Furthermore, nothing that Yu Young Chul recounted matched the crime scene, leading many to believe that maybe he was bluffing while others still remained skeptical. Well, let me tell you a little secret here, but this man, he really was their killer. He was just too stupid to remember. So, with all of this in mind, who precisely was Yu Young Chul? And with his motive so seemingly unclear, what caused him to supposedly murder 30 people? Well, as it turns out, Young Chul has actually been in prison before, boasting 14 convictions for minor offences and acts of violence such as theft, identity fraud, forgery, sexual abuse, and even the distribution of indecent images involving minors. All of which collectively meant that he had spent a total of nine years in prison. At this point in time, the officers recognised that they were dealing with a violent man who enjoyed power play and sadistic games. To make things even worse, he decided to play with the officers by faking an epileptic seizure. And this is where the authorities made a horrendous mistake. And that's because after loosening his restraints and leaving him alone in the interrogation room, Yu Young Chul escaped from the station. Now this was extremely embarrassing for the precinct. They had quite literally allowed a serial killer to escape from prison. And what's worse, he might strike again. And so, they made their way back to the Red Light District, where they then notified brothel owners that he was once again on the run. But thankfully, Young Chul's newfound freedom would not last very long. In a moment of sheer luck, they found the man walking across a crosswalk as if nothing had happened. And of course, after tackling him to the ground, Young Chul would once again put up another tough fight. In a matter of just 24 hours, Yu Young Chul was once again in custody. But this time, he seemed to be rather cooperative with the authorities. The thing is, you see, he was not ashamed of his actions. In fact, he seemed to be rather proud to telling them how he murdered his victims. And let me tell you, it's honestly not for those with a weak stomach. Soon enough, he would confess to murdering his elderly victims, and that, furthermore, he murdered them by bludgeoning them with various blunt objects, including a very large hammer. In order to prove to investigators that he genuinely did carry out these murders, he created maps depicting the layout of each house. This also included where the bodies were found and various items of interest. Young Chul claimed that his motive behind these murders was not theft or burglary, but instead was a simple disdain for the wealthy. He claimed to have grown up in near poverty, and spent most of his adult life behind bars while trying to make a name for himself. And so, with all of these efforts in vain, he grew hatred to those who simply had it easy. He also claimed to have murdered nine female escorts by calling up various agencies, collecting handed out flyers from the red light district, and then looking through various personal ads to find his victims. He would then meet up with them to utilise their services, lead them back to his apartment and have sex with them, and then plan to murder them. Young Chul would use his bathroom as a gateway to hell. It was in that room that he would grab his hammer, sneak up behind them while they were freshening up, and then beat them to death. With him living on the third floor of an apartment complex, he would then place their bodies in the bathtub before removing their heads with a meat cleaver, 
and then he would hang that head on the wall. After that, he would then carefully separate the body into several more pieces so they could all fit into small plastic bags. And taking things one step further, he would even pay for his own x-rays so he could study his body and get a more straightforward cut. I guess this is yet another hallmark of a vintage serial killer, because nowadays you'd just go on Google, but I guess back then they didn't have that luxury. After the grisly cleanup, he would then drive them out to the countryside, hike up a mountain trail, and then bury their bodies in a shallow grave. In the end, all of his victims lay less than one meter apart from each other, and under only 50 centimeters of dirt. As proof, he was more than happy to lead the authorities to the grave sites, where all nine bodies recovered were marked with trash used as gravestones. Young Chul also shared that while his hatred towards the wealthy was his initial motive, that did actually change over time. In the year 2003, Young Chul discovered that his girlfriend was actually an escort, and when she refused to stop seeing other men, he took that betrayal way too personally. Alongside this unfortunate incident, his new partner had also found out about his previous criminal record, and after finding out about how much of a monster he really was, she swiftly cut ties with him. This gave young Chul a deep resentment towards women, especially escorts. And so, consequently, it threw him into a rage that reignited his murderous impulses. Now, despite the frequent rejections, young Chul was not always unlucky with love. In fact, he had been married once before in the year 1992, and had even had a son with his wife. However, this marriage fell apart shortly after the birth of their child leaving Young Chul to be single for most of his remaining adult life. Young Chul claimed that he was an average man during the daytime. However, as night fell, his dark and violent tendencies would come out to play. Even more disturbing, he claims to have eaten some of his victims, most notably their livers, and this is why some parts of their bodies were missing. It was clear that he relished the power over his victims, and he was confident and even proud about their murders. And so, for quite obvious reasons, this case literally haunted the country of South Korea, and Yoo Young Chul became one of the most prolific serial killers to date. Throughout court proceedings, Young Chul would often stand in front of cameras and crowds, and proudly announce that he was responsible for the murders he had committed. Roughly translated, he would tell them, women shouldn't be sluts, and the rich, they know what they've done. No surprise, but as part of his trial, he was assessed by a criminal psychologist, but was not deemed to be mentally compromised. It also became evident that he was aware of the immorality of his actions, recognized through his efforts to conceal bodies and then evade the law. Furthermore, psychologists believe that he had created his own belief system and exhibited signs of antisocial personality disorder. It was on September the 6th, 2000, 2004, that young Chul made his first court appearance. During this time, he refused to defend himself and told the authorities that he would not attend the rest of his trial. Unlucky for him, he had no choice, but during his forced attendance, he did become quite agitated and even lunged at officials when upset. Anyway, on December the 13th, 2004, Yu Young Chul was found guilty of 20 counts of murder. And no surprise, in line with Korea's judicial system, he was sentenced to death for his crimes. The Seoul District Court responded with, murders of as many as 20 people are unprecedented in the nation, and a very serious crime. The death penalty is inevitable for you, in light of the enormous pains inflicted on the families concerned and the entire society. Since then, Young Chul has been held at the Seoul Detention Center under maximum security for the past two decades, where, to this day, he awaits his final fate. Although capital punishment is indeed permissible by law in South Korea, it has not actually been carried out since the year 1997. During his trial, Young Chul actually thanked the judge for receiving the death penalty, and so I can imagine that he is not too pleased with the delay unless, of course, he was acting badass for the attention. What is sad, though, is that many innocent individuals lost their lives to this monster all because he wanted revenge and power for not feeling in control over his own life. His victims were partners, parents, sons and daughters, and I'm sure their loved ones miss them to this very day. Although Yu Young Chul claims to have murdered 30 people, 
only 20 are guaranteed. Even still, at least 20 people will never know the future that they were supposed to have, all because of the terrible actions of one selfish individual. Let us hope that the families of these victims will find peace in knowing that he will never see another day of freedom. And I suppose that brings us to the end of this haunting story. I'm not going to lie, this was quite a heavy one to cover, and some of the details needed heavy filtering. And so, on that note, tell me what you think about this case. It's a little bit different because we're focusing on a serial killer here, so it's quite hard to zone in on the details. And also, would you like to hear more stories from Asia? Because, quite honestly, there are some absolutely crazy stories out there. Anyway folks, thank you so much for watching this story today, I really do appreciate you being here. If you want to support me and the channel, then please consider checking out my Patreon, which is here. You can get early access to my videos and additional content. Alternatively, you can check out my social media, most notably my Instagram, here. Also, if you're in the market for coffee and want to try out my own brand, then check out Classified. That's classifiedcoffeeco.com. Anyway folks, that's pretty much the end of the video today, so thank you again so much for watching, and as always, I'll see you again very soon for another one. Until that moment arrives so remember to look after yourself, look after each other, and as always, stay safe. Thank you, and goodbye.